Okay, I'm really excited for our next guest on the Bulletproof Dental Practice podcast. His name is John Warlow, and he is an award-winning entrepreneur. He's an advisor, and most importantly, he is an author to three of, of my favorite books. Uh, the first one is called Built to Sell, which is you've been listening to this podcast. You know that um, I talk about it a lot, and it was one of those books that kind of transformed or, or, or turned on the light bulb in my head in my career. And it helped me learn that systems and operations and creating repeatable uh, standard operating procedures are, are crucial even to the world of dentistry. Uh, the next was an automatic customer, and that's creating a subscription business in any industry. And the one I'm listening to right now is called The Art of Selling Your Business. Um, and it's not because I'm in the, the, uh, the market of selling the practice or anything like that. It's mainly because it's just important to see what the other side is thinking. And I think that when you pick your head up and look at, you know, just getting the optics for your career and looking what the other side may want, whether that's five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, whatever it is, whether that's, you know, a, a dentist that you're going to transition to, or maybe private equity or something, it's nice to, to know what, what that side of the table will be thinking about. So again, I'm really excited to have him on the podcast. John is one of those people that when I set out with a podcast years ago, he was one of those people that you write down wish list of people that you hope to be able to talk to in your, uh, in your journey. And John is one of those people. So really excited to share it and let's get after it. Thanks. John, based on the, uh, the intro that I got, everyone's gotten some context about who you are, what you do, who you advise. And as we were talking before hit record, you are not involved in dentistry. You just advise on kind of agnostic to business as a whole which is nice. I really, when you said, look, I'm not a dental expert, you know, it's actually nice to hear that, to give some context outside, to get some fresh eyes on the things that we talk about. So I'm going to give you some context of, of the way dentistry is valued. Um, so dentistry tr traditionally is valued at a percentage of top line revenue. And typically it's up to about 80% of top line revenue. And mainly that's predicated on the fact that that's what banks are willing to lend on. So you see these dentists go through valuations of their practice and all of a sudden it always comes back at like 81, 79, 78% of top line revenue. And I dug in today in preparation for this call, looking at for like, what was the average sale from an EBITDA perspective? And um, so I looked at it, it seems that it's the average sale, Craig, and I don't know if I've ever shared it to you from 2019 was 0.65 times, 0.65 times of top line revenue the SDE, which is, if, if for those listening don't know what SDE is, it's the, essentially the, uh, the owner's benefit, the total owner's benefit of what a business produces for businesses usually under a million dollars. That, that figure was 1.7 times, and the EBITDA was averaging around 1.6 times of a multiple, <laughs> right? And so in dentistry, we've always had this way. It's, I don't know at what point we got this indoctrination evaluation, John, but I don't know if you've ever heard the way dentistry has been done, but it's, it's, it's weird that we just say, Oh, it's a million dollar practice. It's typically worth about 750 to $800,000. Is that common in the way like other businesses are done? Mm, wow. That's a great question. And, and it, it's fascinating that uh, the history behind dental practices trading at that rate based on, on the, the multiple or the, the, the bank's willingness to lend. Yeah, I think th these industry uh, sort of rules of thumb get bantied around. They get bantied around at industry conferences and at trade shows and and just among peers and online. And, and they become sort of uh, embedded, ingrained sort of people kind of feel almost preordained to get that multiple. And sometimes they are shocked to find out they're not even going to get the industry benchmark. And mm -hmm. equally, and I think we'll talk about it today. There's there's ways to get a much better multiple than the industry average. And and I and again, I think we do ourselves a bit of a disservice by clinging to these industry benchmarks mm -hmm. as though they are somehow gospel. Where you know we I've seen people punch well above their weight uh, than the industry standard, if you will. Well, it's an interesting phenomenon that we you know I think there's a trend. Wouldn't you agree, Craig, that people are talking more about EBITDA just because we've he we're hearing it more in the consolidation of dentistry? But sometimes what they're getting shocked with is the fact that the EBITDA comes out negative by the time they kind of yep. they look at what their 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 take home is if they were they were paid as an associate dentist and they're realizing that they really just don't have a business. They had a great job. They don't have a they don't really have a business, and so. You know, sometimes then you revert back to, oh, I don't really want EBITDA. I want top line revenue again, right? Yeah. The percentage of that. So it's, it's this weird quasi space. Like I said, we're in this, we're in this massive consolidation of dentistry. We, Craig and I both contend that it's going to happen to our industry as much as, 
as much as a lot of us don't really want it to happen. Well, just like dermatology and, and veterinary, they've all been consolidated. There's too much cost savings and scale, you know, practice backend services that these bi larger businesses can provide to keep us profitable and frankly, to negotiate against insurance companies and those payers. So it's, it's a foregone conclusion that we're all going to get consolidated. W what I feel is really, uh, and Peter, I just want to add, Peter, I want to add this for, for John, you know, we, we go to school to become dentists. We're, we're really good at our craft. We go through an apprenticeship or a GPR a residency of some sort. And we come out, we've not had one single hour of business training. And we're being told Amazing. by the industry, go out and borrow a million dollars and open up, you know, buy the five dental chairs and all this stuff. And next thing you know, you have eight to 10 people. You've not taken a single course. At least I did. And Peter, Peter, did you have a single he hour of training? One business course, but it was taught by someone who, you know, in all due respect, he really didn't have the chops to be teaching that. Right. So we're thrust into this industry. We don't know what's going on. We, we don't even know, most of us don't even realize that we're actually conducting a business. And when you look at the economics and you actually pay yourself as a person who provides the dentistry in your practice, oftentimes you're not making any money. So this is a really good conversation. I'm glad our listeners are hearing this about profit, about your need to run a, a business that actually is in the black um, so that you can grow it and that you can eventually think about your exit. So um, Peter, I, I was, I was just want to say that for the context that, that John can understand what we're going to be talking yeah. about and, and to make some relevancy to the several books he's got, right. because the, when, when I hear about the automatic customer or the art of selling your business, it's not just about the exit. There's a lot that goes before that. So um, if, if it's okay with you, John, can you kind of describe in your own understanding, and I know you're not a dental expert, but just describe it in just general business terms, the automatic customer. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, look, it's recurring revenue. Recurring revenue is what drives the value of most businesses. It certainly takes your multiple up from, you know, can oftentimes double, triple, quadruple your multiple. And it's it's referred to as automatic customers because they don't have to remember to buy from you. So I think in a dental, you know, practice, you, for most people, you've got to remember to get your cleaning done. You got to call the office, get your appointment. In a recurring business model, it's the other way around. You kind of have to remember not to remember. You you, you effectively are automatically billed each month or each quarter, like each year, membership. for your, like a gym, uh, you know, and and um, and that basically makes sure that you lock in the loyalty of those customers. Mm -hmm. And that drives the value of your company. Oh, so we're not really, a re I always thought, Craig, that's a good point you're bringing. So I've always thought we were recurring because we see people on a frequency of typically when they're done, right, you know, two or three times a year in a hygiene coming in for their teeth cleanings. But you're saying that it really has, it's only applicable when they have to almost take action to turn that off. Like yeah. Amazon you're, Prime. Yeah. You're describing the difference between reoccurring revenue and recurring revenue. So reoccurring revenue is revenue that you get on a relatively consistent basis, but it's sporadic. You never know when you're going to get it. It's like a rash. You get a recurring rash, but you're never sure when it's going to happen again. Whereas recurring is a predictable cadence. It's like when you say to your customers, look, you come in for cleaning twice a year, that costs you 600 bucks. Why don't we just bill you 50 bucks a month? And then you can come in and get your cleaning done, you know, whenever is good for you. That's recurring revenue as opposed to reoccurring revenue. The former recurring revenue, much more valuable in the eyes of an acquirer because they can predict the future, which is what they're trying to do when they buy your business. Yeah, it's a big difference because even if someone's on a six month frequency of their cleanings and they have to remember, they'll remember it nine months and they have to wait a month right. to get in and it's not the same, it's not the same metrics. Or, I, you know, I want to cancel. Can, can we do it in two months and all right. this, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I heard one recently where it's a it's a uh, hairdresser in a Pacific Northwest. I think it's like Portland or Seattle, and they basically do hairdressing on subscription. Basically, it's like, look, pay us whatever it is. I, I can't remember, 20, 30, 40 bucks a month, and you just come in whenever you want a haircut. If you used to get the back of your neck trimmed a little bit, you don't really want the full thing. Great, come on in. Yeah, if you want like a actually. full thing, my, my uh, it, it's called the uh, the like back the of your neck does that, or your salon, salon does that. Yeah, Peter. And they charge you like twelve hundred bucks for the year, and it's like unlimited cuts. Oh, I love thinking, that. I'm, so I'm going to go in every week. Yeah, it's going to happen, and you never wind up going. <laughs> your back of your neck looks the same. Yeah, and they give it fancy well, names like the executive, and you know, one's the like the, the CEO, and then a couple are like the associate. I'm like, I don't want to be the I want to be the CEO, right? <laughs> the junior manager, right? The junior right. Manager. I want to buy that one for four hundred dollars. The fry. Maker. CEO. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, well, good. Yeah. yeah. So in a world, I, I want to talk about this too, um, about, you know, we talked about the consolidation earlier. If someone is willing, and you talked about how people are likely leaving, you know, not punching above their weight category. So if someone hypothetically is wanting to sell your, their practice or business, um, how long do you recommend they take to get, if, if I said, Hey, John, I want to be out and on the beach by, uh, you know, in five years, when would I, when would I start to sell my practice hypothetically? Or yeah. When would so, I start to get ready. Cause I, it's not just, Hey, wake up and, and sell, sell your practice or your business. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's two parts to your question. Uh, one is, you know, think about selling a business as having two parts, the, the actual transaction is one part. And then everything you do to get ready for the transaction is another part. I call that value building. Mm -hmm. So the actual transaction, you should expect about a year from the day you hire someone to represent you through to the check clears your bank account. Now, keep in mind a lot of professional services firms, practices, I dare say it's probably the same in dentistry, have some sort of earnout component to them, two, yes. three, five years as much. But I want which... to talk about that too. So we're going to, yes. So we'll going. get into that. So, so look, it, you know, if you want to be in beach in five years, it's going to take a year to actually consummate a transaction and a three-year earnout. You probably want to, you know, really get on your front foot and start transacting or start you know, four years mm -hmm. before you actually want to be on the beach. The piece around building a valuable company can be a lifetime, right? That, that can take you as, as, as long as you start your dental practice. And the key component to building a valuable company, I mean, if you want to distill, you know, lots of, you know, relatively complicated business lessons into sort of one idea, it's, it's can your dental practice thrive without you personally mm -hmm. seeing patients. That's the essence of mm -hmm. a valuable dental practice is can your practice thrive without you seeing patients? If the answer to that is yes, you have a sellable company. Right. And if you don't, you got to start that, 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 I mean, that, that is worth its weight in gold. It's so, it's so simply put and people, dentists conflate working in the business and working on the, they, they don't, they don't actually think of it the same. So Oftentimes we'll hear our, our dental colleagues say, well, well, you don't work anymore. You only work two days a week because you're only seeing patients on Monday and Friday or what, mm -hmm. what have you. So there's this like, anim not animosity, but you lose your street cred if you're just mm -hmm. doing what a businessman would do, you know, hiring, firing, managing, looking at the P&L, all the things that a normal business person would do. You lose your street yeah. cred if you don't, if you're not working, you're not working today. So right. it's interesting yeah. because that's, that's part of the problem. You got yeah, be for sure. And Michael Gerber was the guy who first recognized that, right? He was the one who coined that on versus yeah, in e idea in the e-myth. E -myth, yeah. And, and I think it's, it's absolutely the, the core idea is, is, you know, we all have uh, a tendency towards being practitioners, right? Like we have an industry expertise mm -hmm. and in your case, it's dentistry and in other case, other industries is different, but the kind of core idea is that we feel like we are being productive when we're seeing customers, when we're helping patients, it's like what we are sort of supposed to be doing. Right. And of course, the moment, you know, all the time you spend actually with patients is, is in many ways is actually undermining the value of your practice as opposed to uh, helping. It's helping your income and your revenue and your top line and your, perhaps your profitability, but ultimately undermining the value of your company. So. Well, it's like you start off doing your craft. If you're a salesperson, if you're the lead salesperson, you're selling, if you're the dentist, you're doing the work. And that's that's what got you to the point where you can actually pivot and now start working on the business. So the natural default progression of the dentist would be just to do more dentistry and do more right. dentistry, the salesperson to sell more, sell more. And, you know, like I think you mentioned in your book, uh, uh, um, uh, it was literally in Built to Sell. It was like the guy that's traveling to, to, to Europe. Yeah. Uh, or whatever. Right. It was well, you know, it's it's traveling funny. to go to go make another sale. Like that's the worst possible thing you can be doing is actually, mm -hmm. but even no matter how much money you can bring in the top line. John, I referenced in my, in the introduction that, you know, Craig and I get asked as, as being kind of influencers in dentistry, like what are some good books? What are some things? And I always, I always reference built to sell because I think it's important for, and it was a light bulb moment for me as a practitioner, as someone who, you know, I was the, you know, the LeBron James in my own practice and, and without me there at a certain, you know, way back in the day, now that's not the case, but way back in the day, it, you know, everything was kind of predicated. I was the, you know, the jack of all trades and, and master of none kind of thing. And, and I was involved in being the one who, who, who did all the processes. 
and kind of reading your book, I was like, wait a second, it doesn't have to be this, this hard and it shouldn't be this stressful. And it got me into that system, you know, like, like the method of when uh, your character, um, you know, went through the, the five-step process of the logo design. And I was like, you know, and that's when I really dove into the systemization of, of my practices and, and subsequently have grown, you know, uh, multiple, multiple locations from that now up to seven locations by, by really getting into the systems of it and me getting out of the way into more of a, a CEO role versus a practitioner role. That's fantastic. Um, and, so and I want to thank to know you how... really having a, a, a big transformation in, in my life and career uh, publicly. Oh, yeah. So thank you. I'm glad it worked for you and I'm glad it, it, it applies to dentists. I'd be curious, Peter, how did you apply the idea of systemizing? Like in the in Built to Sell, it's about the five-step process. Like mm -hmm. what's your five-step process effectively? Yeah, so obviously in dentistry, it's not, it, you can't distill it down because there's so many different procedures, but I got real, real systematic with like, these are the way we do things. And we, st and we create idealized systems of whether through a video recording or a checklist process, of the way we do things so that it helps onboard new, new people. And it's not so predicated on star people as it is just getting, getting a system down because that becomes a bottleneck. There's only so many like thoroughbreds and a players that you can hire just to get stuff yeah. done. You really have to kind of, you really have to kind of distill it down so that everyone can, can thrive in that, in that system-based environment. So I, I, I made a process to as many things as, as that I could create a process to. Here's how we answer the phones correctly. Here's a video that demonstrates that. Here's how we check people in. Here's how we demonstrate that. Here's this procedure that we do veneers. Here's how we demonstrate that and systematize it as much as possible so that it's, it's system-driven, not people-driven. I mean, That's it's still people-driven, but you know what I'm trying to say, right? It, 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 it allows for people to go rogue a lot less because there's, there's guidelines and frameworks in place. That's fantastic. And That's then fantastic. honestly, and then onboarding partners in my, in my experience, and then onboarding partners to help then grow you know, me, me finding what I really yeah, like local, to do, local, local people, local level management that has equity to the bottom line. So in each of his locations, he has an equity partner. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, that's a, that was a really, yeah. So that's know, how, that's how it was applied to. And that's to, a forward thinking idea in dentistry, by the way, people don't typically do that. There's no local level ownership that you can have. That's not normal. Um, hmm. Unfortunately, dentists don't think as, as, as broad as we should. I mean, our success and failures lies in the micromillimeter. So we tend to get fairly myopic on our businesses as well. Um, but, uh, and we also, I've never thought about that. Right. We also make a lot of, you know, the environment the, too, mind you, with the tongue flapping around. It's like, yeah. it's off by a half a millimeter. It's a failure. I'm a yeah. failure. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's, the, you know, I'm sure you do know that we have unfortunately very high rates of drug ad abuse and suicide. I mean, it's, it's colloquial yeah. knowledge to know that. So, you know, we're, we're trying, Peter and I got this podcast going really because we, we've stood on the shoulders of giants. We've helped, uh, we've been helped along the way. And it's a, it's a noble profession, one that's trusted, one that we get to help people. Um, it, you know, we get to develop long-term relationships with our patients or our clients, if you will. And uh, it's really rewarding. And there's just this disconnect. There's so many dentists that reach 65 years old and they can't retire or they, they never thought of their practice as a business. Mm -hmm. Things like calling to, to, to many dentists, if you said your business, they would be offended. They'd be like, oh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Warlow, it's a practice. Or they're not customers, they're patients. But yet we have an obligation to grow the business for the sake of our people, if not for ourselves. So it's, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot there and, and I'm, I'm glad you're listening to us and using that great brain of yours to, to think about how this applies to, to all the concepts you've perfected. Hmm. And I mean, it's, it's not, it's not uh, restricted to dental uh, dentistry. I mean, we see this in virtually every other industry. It's most pronounced in a professional services context where there is a pride to delivering the service. Mm -hmm. One gets a, a tremendous sort of ego boost if you're a lawyer, for example, or if you're a uh, pick another profession, an accounting firm, and you, right. and, you, and you solve a particularly vexing challenge for or a client. Architect, yeah. Yeah, you're all of a sudden the ego, you know, the, the chest bumps out and you're like, you feel good about yourself. You're making a contribution. You're helping people. And and I'm often, you know, like, I, again, I'm preaching to the choir and saying this to you guys, but I, I, I just would love for people to sort of just gently move their, uh, their focus from their patients to their business. I'm reminded it, it's not a perfect parallel, but I, I think it might land for you guys. I was uh, 20 years ago or more, maybe more than that now, I was invited to this thing called the Birthing of Giants. It was the most pretentious named conference at MIT's <laughs> Exec Education 
education campus. They've since rebranded it, thank God. But in any event, it was for entrepreneurs. 60 of us uh, got into this sort of like amphitheater style seating for like three days of amazing speakers. All these speakers came in, Pat Lynchoni talking about building a, a team. And, and this one guy walks in, he just sold his company. And, and he said, listen, I'd just like everybody to raise their hand for those of you who are involved in selling and marketing your product or service. And like all of our hands went up in the air because we all thought of ourselves as you know, relatively like the, the practice of, of being a sales and you know, marketing and influencer was important. He said, okay, put your hands down. And he said, you've all got the right skills. You're selling the wrong product. You need to invest effectively in hiring salespeople to sell your product. You should be focused on selling your business. And I dare say, Dentists are the same. They've got lots of skills, lots of lots of amazing, obviously very smart by virtue of the fact they're dentists. But if we just move that that uh, that intelligence to how do I structure a company as opposed to you know solve a, pa- a patient's problem, I think that's where uh, where there's a lot of upside. And if you yeah. look at the natural progression, like I'm always a, a big believer in, like why does this happen? The default is in your when you're when you're in the service industry, you get so darn good that the money becomes so incredible. You start out, you're like, am I going to pay my bills? All of a sudden, you refine your craft, you learn about your craft, all of your education, your continuing education is related to how to get better at your craft, and then eventually, you have even though you're you've got a job, you've got a job like LeBron has a job. You can make <laughs> so much money that it's like. How do I get off this treadmill? Because if you're earning, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars doing what you do, and you want to slow that down and manage the business, you could actually go through a period where you have to take a haircut at a place where you're really, really productive. You know, so it's yeah. it, it, it's it just it the natural progression is you're going to get good at it. And we noticed Peter and I noticed this. We have a very aberrant path. Peter and I became experts in dentistry. We got famous people to come to us. We could charge these higher fees, and we were we we reached a high degree of notoriety. And then we started pivoting and growing a business. Most of the business dental business people we know they never got good at their craft. Hmm. So the egg, the jumping off the treadmill was not too painful. They were because just barely they knew what they wanted to do, Craig. They right, they were clear. The industry to be entrepreneurial, not right. not to be yes. So they right. never had a really good exchange for time and money. So when you're great at your craft, you really get a great exchange for time and money. Just not as great as it could be if you grew the company. So it's a trap that's that's by default that kind of happens. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? Like. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it's very common that, that the more lucrative your sort of job is, the, the more difficult it is to walk away from. You know, we talk a lot about this, this thing called the freedom point, which is when you reach a point where the sale of your company would create enough liquid wealth for you to live for the rest of your life. And, and I think when I talk to entrepreneurs, and, and this may be different for dentists, maybe it's a subset of dis, d- dentists, the ambitious ones. But when I talk to entrepreneurs, I think their primary motivation is for independence. It's not because they want a a beach house or the next Tesla or whatever. What I see is a real underlying sort of vein of independence. I I want FU money. I want the freedom to decide when to Mm -hmm. to work. I I, want to call my own shots. I I don't want to be beholden to somebody. And or even, even an angry patient or a, you know, like, you know, like I just, I don't, I want 100% independence. And it's why I think we, in many cases, choose the road less travel. And we, we, we do create independent businesses is because we want that. And, and as much as having a lucrative dental practice is a great source of income, I think most people would agree that if you have a, practice where you have to see patients in order to make that kind of money, you don't have the independence yet. You don't have the freedom that you, in many cases, yearn for. And um, I dare say it's it maybe somewhat different in dental practices because you, you, you have gone to dentist, dentistry school. It was a calling for you at some point in your life, but I'm guessing that at some point, 30, 40, 50 years old, you're like, you know what, right now, what I really crave is freedom is mm-hmm. independence. And that's when making some of these changes we're talking about today is, uh, is so important. I think that was a big, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's the reason a lot of us got into dentistry, you know, and, and didn't go into medicine because, you know, the hospitals and being on call and it doesn't feel so independent. And someone would be telling you what your schedule to be. I think that's what resonates with a lot of dentistry. I, it, I totally agree. It's that independent factor 
And yeah. you're right. I, I the freedom point is is pretty interesting. I don't think maybe is that what you, is that what the name of it is? The freedom point. Yeah, yeah the freedom just, point. Yeah, yeah I when, think, when, and, and I think yeah. we think about that a lot as practitioners because you know dentistry is, is a hard craft. It's a hard thing to do physically. It's a hard thing to do mentally for a long period of time, and, and you get sometimes you get worn out or burnout, yeah. and that happens a lot in our industry. And I think that freedom point is something we all think about a lot. Yeah, um, I think also a lot of people. The, the, the idea or the belief that you're not free is more abhorrent and destructive to your soul <laughs> than getting to freedom. So, you know, there's that saying, I'm going to butcher it now. It's like, you know, dance as if no one's looking and work like you don't have to. Like, so it's an right. interesting inflection point when you get to your freedom point, no pun intended. And you're like, you know what? I still like what I'm doing. Yes. And there's the nothing wrong with work, that too. Right? So I think the belief or knowing it's like having land that's worth a lot of money, but you love using the land or you love using the house. And he's like, I could sell this and live forever off of the, off the estate, off the proceeds from it. So I think free, the freedom point is not just a mechanical or quantitative place. It's actually, there's a lot of qualities that go into it as well. And a lot of dentists, a lot of craftspeople, because we'll throw the dentists and the craftspeople get a lot of fulfillment out of that. And, and I think there's a dialogue that's also in dentistry that says you must grow your business. If you don't grow your business, you're being foolish, you're being silly. But I mean, if you can make the money that you want to make and, and, and enjoy it at a certain point, you might you not want to sell it in which you and want to do that. or just throw it away. So if you get a six times EBITDA or whatever, just work for six, six. years. Or, or a five or whatever. I don't know what it is. If you get X multiple, you can make a decision like take the money now or just work for eight years and throw it away. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot to it. It's nuanced. Uh, it's nuanced with that. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think the only, you know, the only caveat I would say to the uh, stick around for five years and you capture all the value you get if you sold for five times. Well, two things. One is, is in most tax jurisdictions, uh, there's going to be a, a much better tax treatment of selling your practice versus taking that all in income. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if you sell the, uh, the shares of, of you mean more. cap gains versus ordinary income. That's right. Okay. Yeah. We're all aware, though, that cap gains may be going away, right? Yeah, I, as we did, record that, this. Yeah, exactly. By the time this comes out in four or five days, we'll have a 46% cap gains tax. So yeah. uh, we don't want to yeah. date ourselves. I'm in I'm in, uh, in Toronto, Canada, where we, we, we oh, still good. have a capital gains exemption. So yeah, no, so yeah, no. we, you're aware of what's happening in your in your neighbors to the south here. We're yeah. seeing, we'll see. But yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. So it, no, it, I was just saying that you know the the uh, you know, there is that favorable tax treatment in some cases, depending on the way you structure the deal. The other piece is that, you know, and I've learned this from Tim Ferriss, actually, I, I had a chance to interview Tim and I said, why did you sell brain quick? And for those of you who don't know, Tim Ferriss, he's the, you know, you yeah. like have to live under a rock, not to know who he is, but titans, man. The four hour work week guy and many others. And, and I said, in many, many people don't know the story, but he got the money to kind of start writing and, and live an independent lifestyle by selling a small company called Brain Quicken, which was a natural supplements company. And uh, and I said, why did you sell it if it if it was all the way down to four hours a week or whatever? Like, why didn't you just kind of hold it? And he said, yeah, it was only taking me four hours a week, but it was taking me a lot much a lot more in mental energy. Mm. And I said, what did that feel like? And he said, it felt like if you've ever used a computer running antivirus software you know what that feel like. It's just like everything is slow. Like you're walking through quicksand because even when you're not in the company, it's sort of churning, taking up CPU, uh, you know, mm -hmm. cycles. Uh, and that happens with your family life, you know, when you're sleeping at night. And, and that's, I think one of the hidden costs of business ownership that, uh, that I think building a more valuable company, the one that you could sell somewhat alleviates. But it's different in dentistry, like you alluded to earlier, you know, it's not the scenario in a service-based industry. It's not this situation where you can just hand the key here. You, here you want to buy it, hand the keys over and take off. Typically there is, you know, performance-based money and some holdback clauses, especially if you sell to a DSO. So uh, in our, a DSO just so you know, is a dental service organization. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say. So yeah. in our world, like DSOs are dental service organizations, they're usually backed by private equity groups to help and go aggregate buying practices. And typically they have three or four sets of numbers that are, you know, it's not just a, here's what I'm going to give you for your practice scenario. It's, you know, here's your cash at close. Here's some money that's going to be held back. Here's some performance-based money or clawback. 
Um, here's some roll forward equity into the new co and all these things, you know, but, but what they present to you is, well, here's your enterprise value. We're going to give you $5 million for your, for your practice. It's enterprise value. Oh, but it's only yes. 2.5 at close. And then, you know, the escrow. So can you walk through, cause I know oh, you, yeah. you, you, you speak about that a lot in you your, speak, in your yeah, book. Exactly. Yeah, in your new book, forward, you talk yeah. about, you know, about, you know, selling of a business and all the kind of the pitfalls. So I think this is still applicable to dentistry because this is the way the industry is headed, right? It's going more towards the private equity, the agnostic business. They're buying, you know, if it has EBITDA, they're willing to buy it. And I think dentistry has become the darling even more so in today's day and age of, of private equity wanting to buy based on COVID and, and us kind of getting out of that really quickly and recession proof. And also the fact, just as just anecdotal, I have a lot of friends in like Tiger 21 and YPO and, and there are lots and lots of talks about all of those members nationwide wanting to get into dentistry. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the hot, it's the hot sauce of the um, hot sauce, but special know, sauce. sauce. Yeah. Hot so, and special sauce, the special sauce. <laughs> the, uh, so I'm hearing that. And so anyway, what my question is, can you talk about some of the, 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 the fancy vernacular of the cash at close and the holdback and the things, the pitfalls that, that, that we should be knowing about? Yeah. Wow. That's a huge topic and love to dig in with you on that. So <laughs> time we have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. You're right. So, I mean, if you put yourself in the acquirer's point of view, the DSO, the, the private equity group, whatever, you know, they're trying to minimize their risk. I mean, that's the essence of an investor's job, right? And so the way they do that is they try to use some effectively, um, deferring some or putting some risk into your hands. Mm -hmm. And so one way they do that is, is on an earnout. An earnout is essentially where you agree to a, a value of your company. And then there is a future payment if you achieve certain goals in the future, usually tied to the profitability of your practice, maybe tied to top line revenue, but some sort of economic goal in the future. That's an earnout. Um, but you get paid for your business up front, and then there's a second or third payment if there's a, if if the success goes uh, if there's a future um, success. Another possible scenario is where you're asked to roll equity into a new entity, and this is much more common with private equity groups. So they will buy the majority of your shares, but not all of your shares, and they'll ask you to roll some equity into a new entity where you become a minority shareholder. Now, the challenge with that is that you're effectively trading a company where you're the 100% shareholder, or likely the majority shareholder, where you call the shots, to a situation where you're a minority shareholder in an illiquid business. It's, it's not necessarily, in most cases, liquid enough to sell those shares. I, I'm, I'm reminded of a guy named Ryan Moran. I interviewed on my podcast. Now, again, the example comes outside of dentistry, but I think you'll, you'll get it. He built a company uh, called Sure Strength, $18 million in revenue, where he sold it. Now, when he sold it, he sold 60% of the company. And so he got a big check, but he also rolled a lot of his value into this new entity. And when he said to the private equity groups, he said, look, I don't want to run this company anymore. Bring in somebody to run it. And they brought in a manager to run it. Problem was manager didn't really know what Ryan was doing to run his business so successfully. Long story short, the business started to crater, uh, started to suck cash, couldn't pay down the debt the private equity group had used to buy the business. And his 40% of equity went to zero. And he had no recourse because he wasn't the majority shareholder. Couldn't fire the, you know, the, couldn't 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 make the decision to to change ownership. So that's the challenge, I think, with a a rolling equity is that it's 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 twofold. It's number one, it's not usually liquid, and number two, you don't necessarily control the outcome of that. And, right. Um, so that that's the common methodology in dentistry, the exact scenario you mentioned. So imagine <laughs> the like, and, and most of the DSOs, uh, you know, right now we have a very interesting uh, paradigm and, and I don't know if it exists in other businesses, but the marketplace is so hot. And this is not just recently post Corona. This is like for the last five to seven years. The, the idea is that private equity thinks that you take several you know, regular dental practices, you can buy them at three, four or five times EBITDA, and you just simply aggregate them, just simply aggregate them. You, you use a little bit of your tools for better efficiency, maybe better procurement costs and lower your health insurance. It's an all of a sudden, poof, 
they're worth 10 times EBITDA as an aggregate. <laughs> so, and, and by the way, the same store sales growth, single, low single digit sales growth. So it's not like you're crushing top line revenue and saving on the cost. You're just kind of doing an aggregation play. So it's an interesting thing because all these DSOs are popping up all over the place because there's so much runway. And there's, it, we, Peter and I joke around, it's called a duct tape DSO. It's not a real platform. You know, mm -hmm. like I would imagine, I don't know Chick-fil-A, but I imagine if your store isn't doing good growth, your store, they're going to get involved. They're going to move it to a different franchise. They're going to close it. So it's an interesting time because what's being rewarded is Wall Street is fueling this. The private equity money is fueling this. And it's not really great for the, for the dental business because, just to your point, the DSO says, okay, only one cotton roll for this. Oh, by the way, your hygienist is going to get 30 minutes to do the job instead of 60 minutes. And you're sitting there as a minority. Well, hey, guys, uh, you know, I think it would be a good idea. And no, we're not. And then, by the way, if there's systems that they made you use, cause your business to go down, guess whose money gets clawed back in that minority? Yeah, the so it's like you, you almost walk you in, in some, the unfortunate circumstances, you're watching this happen as like an un, uh, you know, a bystander. You've run the business and you're watching the PE tear it up, you know, kind of try to save their way to the top and it winds up affecting your bottom line. So it's just, it's interesting to look at the dental world because you have your eyes on other worlds. I don't know, and my, my brain is small on this subject. I don't know of other consolidation businesses where same store sales do not increase, where there's a play like that. Like I imagine that like the mom and pop hardware store or the dry cleaner, they would drive top and bottom line. You would think, I mean, isn't that, wouldn't that be a bit? Uh, yeah. In a lot of cases, I think, you know, pharmacy comes to mind, optometry comes to mind. Right, where the, right. The, the buying volume is so critical to the rebates they get from the drug companies, the rebates they get from the, the glass manufacturers, that there is an accretive play um, it, 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 for a private equity group that without really improving their top line. But it's, uh, you know, it, it, you're, you're, you're mentioning a really interesting phenomenon. It's like the buy low, sell high kind of idea is that, you know, if, if you're right, if they buy you for four times EBITDA, yet they can roll together a larger stitched up group and sell it for eight or 10 or 12, it's, it's incredibly that profitable for the private equity group. Keeping in mind that when they buy you, they're not putting four times EBITDA in cash into the deal. They're yeah, so usually they're using debt, right? right, right. Uh, they may ask you to carry some of that debt in the case yeah. of a vendor take back. So yes, it's, it's financial engineering. And, and I'm, you know, like you could probably sell from my sentiment and my tone of voice. I'm not a huge fan of, of the, this kind of deal because I feel like it's it is financial engineering at its worst and it's not adding value it's not creating a better company it's just moving the zeros and ones on an spreadsheet right so, which is so abhorrent to us it's so it's so upsetting so what it's forcing in our industry and again I'm just talking here it's the only way you'd want to sell under that paradigm is the effort card you're like I'm, I'm blank years right. old I can't deal with it anymore I have no more fire in my belly I'm getting my ass kicked let me just sell. So where, you know, it's interesting when Peter and I are having conversations privately, where's the guy that's got a hunger in his belly and says, not only do I want to join together and save all, you know, uh, on the procurement and all that stuff, but I want to help grow. I want to help the top line too. And it's just funny that doesn't exist. And maybe, you know, so it's just an interesting, um, yeah, but it, I feel the same way. It's upsetting Peter and I at a great deal and it's just not great for the profession. Because as these dentists sell and they, you know, they they wait their three years, they're they're usually out. And that's what's affecting the same store sales growth. So you got Dr. Jones, who's been practicing for 10, 15, 25 years, he gets his money and then he's out. And now they have a, you know, kind of a watered down. And you made up a very good point, like in the optical space, potentially the procurement costs are so good that mm -hmm. you can actually just buy so low, you can actually mm -hmm. grow top line. Just but, it, you know, scale, I don't, yeah. I don't think there's that type of savings on the, you know, below the line, you know, on, on the dental practice, you know, supply costs are 5%. So what are they going to do? Three employment costs are 25. They'll go to 21. There's not, you know, you have yeah. to really get that top line moving as well. And you are, you guys already get great rates from banks on like buying equipment, right? So, because they know yeah. it's rock solid. So you're not saving yeah. Everybody wants to loan to a dentist. Yeah. <laughs> Which is one of the reasons why we can't retire because we buy the second, third house. We're like that we get these mailers, by the way, John, it's like 110% financing just for dentists. Just like, for dentists. Oh my God, yeah. they must really like me. This yeah. is great. No, they, they know you're good for it for the rest right. of your right. life. <laughs> exactly. We won't be faulting.
And that's yeah. why we get sold like predatory financial products. Someone wants to golf with us, like, oh, they really like me. Because we get to do we get we get paid to do the right thing for our patients. And we develop 20-year relationships with people. So we just look at the world through that lens. Like we we see a guy who's selling us whole life insurance. Like he really likes me. He wants to take me out to dinner. This is great. <laughs> we'll buy whatever he's selling. <laughs> right, Peter? Uh, totally. And we get romantic about the, the, you know, our friendships and our vendors and our relationships and the people that we form. You know, I think we're very relationship based as, a, as an industry, and it's uh, yeah. it's hard. It's hard to differentiate <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, that's um, for sure. John, are you seeing a huge? Just you know, z- let's zoom out of dentistry for a second. Are you seeing just a ton of deal flow or people at, at coming to you? You know, in other industries, it, um, as a whole, because it, it, my sentiment is, and I talking to my buddies who are not dentists is that there's just, it seems like so much money available for deals and buying and all this stuff that, that the world seems has gotten a little crazy. And I don't know if that's because of all the money print money printing or co I don't know what it's from, but it just seems like the world's a little bit like crazy right now. Yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. There is a lot of money flowing through the system and, and you know, from, from, you know, in, um, stimulus checks right through to the low interest rates that we've got right now that, that make it all keep in mind the, the small and mid-sized businesses. So practices that are a million bucks in profits, 2 million, but like the private equity is who's buying those. And again, mm-hmm. that's fueled by debt that the, it's written into the sort of playbook of the business plan that, that, in, in, in environments of low interest rates, you can make off like a king. And therefore it's, it's very, very, uh, uh, you know, very, very frothy right now in that space. The other thing that I'm seeing in particular in service businesses is that the pandemic has left a scar, you know, the pandemic, uh, is left an emotional scar for a lot of entrepreneurs. And it's, it's left a, uh, I think there's a lot of people that have have left the pandemic saying, "That's it, I'm out." I, you know, mm-hmm. I've lived through the Great Recession, I've we lived through 9/11, all this, you know, and and I can't do it anymore. I can't ride this emotional roller coaster. And again, service businesses really took it on the chin in the pandemic. I know I'm telling you guys something you already know, but I think you know if you had a product business um, or a technology business things were pretty good during the pandemic if you had a service business where you were dealing with people um, up close and personal in their mouth for example <laughs> it, you know it was tough and I think a lot of people are like I'm out I, you know I'll get what I can get for my company and you know interest rates are low and I'm getting offers and so yeah I'm seeing a lot of activity mm-hmm yeah, we're, we're hearing it outside of just Craig. I know you had mentioned that, like a lot of your friends, even. Oh yeah, it's just it's just crazy town. Everybody's saying if the if it's not bolted down to the floor, sell it like everything. But <laughs> it, you know, uh, I, John, I, I'm going to ask you a question that might be hard, but I but I value just your opinion and your your beliefs on it. What do you think comes around this corner? What do you think economically? comes around the corner for us three to five years down the road with, with the amount of money in circulation, you know, as it pertains to valuations, you know, I'm not asking you to give me a global and macroeconomic, but what do you think is going to happen? Like, you know, do you think there's good times ahead or not so much, or there has to be a day of reckoning, I'm sure. Yeah. I think there probably will be a day of reckoning at some point. Again, it's all tied to interest rates. As those interest rates start to creep up, I would expect valuations to drop quickly. And, and that's so that there's a real, there's a real, you know, binary relationship between those two things. So as you start to see inflation creep up, people start worrying about inflation, interest rates will go up. And ultimately when that happens, valuations go down. The the good news is that the value of your privately held business is likely very similar to a lot of other asset classes. Uh, whether that's commercial real estate, whether that is residential real estate, you're a ski chalet in in Colorado, like they're all very much tied to interest rates. And so what we are likely to see is some sort of reckoning a drop in, in valuation over time. But equally, you're probably going to see a similar drop in a lot of other things, the publicly traded stock markets, for example. And so you, you know, you'll have an opportunity to buy into an asset class that you might not have bought into at a discount as well. So I, t- I personally think kind of trying to time the sale of your company to some sort of mythical height in the market mm-hmm. is really a bit of a fool's errand because you have to do something, you know, with the money. You have to convert um, it into a new asset class. Right. Yeah, right. That's the problem. The problem with people that sell have a new problem. 
yeah, you got to do something with it, right? Uh, and so I think, I, you know, I think a better way to think about timing is, is again, this kind of co concept of the freedom point that if you do reach a point where the sale of your practice would generate enough liquid wealth for you to live comfortably for the rest of your life, I think it's just worth asking the question, do I want to now do something else? Uh, because I think that's where it's, uh, it, you know, that's, I think that's a much more internally driven trigger to sell as opposed to trying to t chase this, like this mythical moment in time where you'll get the maximum for your, you know, and you're going to go buy into the the Dow, whatever it is trading at today, or you're going to buy Bitcoin, or you're going to buy a commercial right. real estate property or whatever. You're all buying into the same assets that are also equally exposed to the same conditions that your practice is. Right, exactly. It's like when your when your house is worth, you know, it's gone through the roof because of local housing prices. You're gonna sell it. You can't pocket the money. You're gonna buy a lesser house for the same amount of money. It's you know, yeah, it, it's true. I, and I also do believe. I, I I think that everybody's willing to give advice holistically. Like this is the top. You got to do it now. This is when you want to do it. And if it doesn't meet your needs both fulfillment, you know, and all the qualitative factors, it's just not the right thing for you to do. So it's like, totally. I, I love the fact that you, you know, kind of follow your heart first. That's always, if it's the right thing that feels right for you. And those are t sometimes it's like asking someone, if yes, asking your best friend, if you should marry the girl you're dating, if you have to ask, it's not the right girl, <laughs> you know, you should, these things, certain things should be known, you know, I mean, yeah. it's nice to get an opinion. I'm thinking about marrying her, but, but you know, there's certain people that just act and we've had guests in the podcast, like sell everything. Absolutely. Like we had a very well-known, you know, uh, business, uh, advisor, really, really well-known famous in fact. And it's just like, if it's not bolted to the floor, you're going to sell now. And even if you run your EBITDA 30, 40% up higher in three to five years, you run your plan perfectly. The valuations will be so low. You'll wind up getting the same money as, as you were. But the interesting mm. thing that John pointed out earlier is, look, there's if there's a buyer, you're going to probably give up the independence that you sought so hard in the beginning to get, yeah, right? right? And so at what cost? Yes, you got you got cash and now you have to figure out what to do with that. But also now you're potentially working for someone that you may well, or may Well, in, like. in our segment it is, but for many of the people that listen to John, they actually own a, you know, paper making factory. And the guy, his, his grandfather started it and right. he adds some degree of strategic value, but he's not making the paper. So he could really walk away with all of the cash. And I mean, That's true. Uh, you mentioned in your book as well, at a certain, you, you've told stories and, you know, saying that if what trades across the table, when you transact, if that doesn't make you happy, you have to recognize that that could be all it is. Because if yeah. you have deferred value in a new hold co and things go awry, you, you may never see it. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen it many, many, many times. I just did a podcast. Like I did an interview with a guy who saw, built a great company. They were doing meal delivery service. And this the meal delivery space has really kind of exploded. And then it's a bit mm -hmm. crashed a bit, but it's a it, it, great successful business. Uh, but he sold, I think, 55% of it, rolled 45% of his equity into a private equity deal. Uh was was removed as the CEO of the company he founded two years later. Now he's the minority shareholder in a company he doesn't even actually run anymore and may yes. never see any liquidity for that, that value. And so I think going back to like, when's the best time to sell? I think yeah, right now is as good a time as any. It's a great, you know, it's obviously a great economic environment, but I think what you want to do is create the deal terms that are most important to you. Uh, the majority of your cash at closing, uh, you know, the menor, a, a small amount of equity rule if you have to, uh, a very small percentage in escrow. We haven't talked about escrow, but effectively it's a portion of the sale proceeds, which is effectively put aside in the event of any legal uh, issues mm -hmm. that comes up during the, the transition period. Again, cash is, you've heard it before a thousand times, king, and uh, the more of it you can get up front. And again, you're in, you're you're the flavor of the month right now. So you're in a great position to do that. There's not just one buyer out there. I think one of the biggest mistakes sellers make is they fall head over heels in love with the first buyer who approaches them. Mm -hmm. And that buyer has an agenda. That buyer is looking for what they call a proprietary deal. Proprietary deal means that you're <laughs> yes. not negotiating with anybody else. And they know that, right? And and again, I just got off the phone with a guy. I, did an, I haven't pushed the podcast live yet, but he got approached at a trade show about someone who wanted to buy his business and he sold it at a, at a multiple, probably 
you know, a couple of turns lower than it was worth because he just, he just did a deal with the first person who was interested. And so I think, look, there's two things that happen when you do a proprietary deal. One is you, you accept lower price for your, for your business. Two, you get worse terms, less cash upfront, more rural equity rule. And the third thing that happens is retrading. And retrading is when they agree to buy your business for X and then they do their due diligence and 30, 60 days later, they, they buy it for X minus 10%. Right. Right. Yeah, your LOI yeah. says you have a million dollars of EBITDA and then they go through the quality of earnings and they say, yeah, you really only have 400. But we're going to honor the, the, we're going to honor the multiple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're still going to pay you five times. But yeah, so, it's on 400 yeah. but the numbers to... are the numbers. So, you know, and yeah, then you're half- Nothing we can do about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, listen, there, there's room and, and Peter and I have been talking a lot about it. And just, just I want to air my thought. There's, there's, there's room in the marketplace to do something where- you you know, you mentioned two things, get as much cash as possible. And then you mentioned earlier the dilemma of what to do with that, that said cash that you close on, yeah. you know, there is room and, and uh, someone's got to do it where there's a ability to bring dental practices together, use the economies of scales procurement and actually have everybody roll together for the sake of the industry. And that's something that Peter and I are going to be using some of our brain power to do, because it's like, if there's a noble cause and you can do it, you can write something such a, such a great profession as dentistry. It's almost like we have an obligation to You're figure that out. Apart. That's that's where I spend some time thinking about that. Yeah, I think. Peter, it's, did I you want to? Did you want to mute me on that one? No. Oh, I I that thought, was Peter, great, you, John, this is the one time in our podcast where Peter has not insulted me. So in the last <laughs> couple moments, just expect just a haymaker. Out a of singer. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah haymaker. just expect. Yeah. I'm, yeah. A haymaker. Kind of a, yeah. No, you're actually on point today. I'm gonna, okay, I'm well, on. That, that, that's kind of a subtle, the subtle insult there today. He that's qualified so it. If you're on point today. So, so we don't, we, John, we really appreciate your time. I know that your time is valuable. And this is just fantastic to have. I, you know, I, I know people like you who have such broad areas of expertise think like, well, dentistry, geez, I don't know. We know the dentistry. We're not looking to you to how to do a better filling. But um, if, if there's anything that this conversation um, has brought to your attention or just listening to the challenges of dentistry, if your brain is going somewhere, is there anything that you're thinking about right now that you'd like to add in the last couple of moments that would be specific to the things we've talked about or to, to help the dentist that might be listening to us? I think we've, I think we've tackled it a lot. And I think the last thing I would share is, is you know, a lot of dentists are also parents. Right. And, and as parents, we've all gone through the process of, of raising kids and there's something happens when they're kind of teenagers, right? They're the in between, right? They kind of need you still, but they're not quite as ready to take your direction. And so they spend a lot of time in the basement playing Fortnite, whatever. And, and I think as parents, we know our job is ultimately to get that 15, 16, 17 year old sort of out of the basement and into the world on their own. And I think, for a lot of people, that's going to be a helpful analogy for this transition from owning a business that is deeply dependent on you to effectively becoming the parent of the business. Mm -hmm. At some point, the kids have to grow up, right? They have to get out of the house and they have to be able to thrive without you for it to have value. And if that analogy helps your listeners at all think about their role as being less about a dentist and more about the, the parent of their business, and that over time, we got to put the systems and the processes in place so that, you know what, they can kind of do it without me. And that's going to be the essence of a valuable, sellable company. And it's also, I love that analogy and super helpful. And it's also not just about you as the business owner and the sale, but like if you got hit by a bus, like the, you're employing people and, and you have something that's worth your legacy. And it's also just, it's prudent to you to look at it like, hey, I know it needs me. But someday something could happen to you and you want this thing to continue. So it's also like succession planning and for your state and stuff like that to think of it that way that your job. And I use that analogy with my young kids. I tell them all the time, like at 18, I really lose my legal ability yeah. to tell you what to do. So I'm just I've got seven years left to my daughter. I got to make the rules of this house reflect the rules of society or else you're in for a rude awakening. I can't call your boss and ask for a raise for you. You know, you got to you got to get out and fly. So I love that analogy. I think it's really, really cool context. So thank you for that. That's cool. Yeah, no problem. That is great. John, we want to be respectful of your time, like Craig said, and I uh, just really appreciate you leaning in and helping, you know, our industry and, and getting on. It's been, a, it's been a wish list of mine to get you on ever since the podcast was started to have you because, you know, your books have made such impact, like I said, the book oh, to indeed. sell. And now, you know, I'm, I sent Craig about 100 texts about the art of selling your business company. It's just, 
it was so applicable. So I was like, dude, look at this timestamp here. This timestamp here is just, it's just such great fodder. And then the automatic customer, of course. So everyone listening, every bulletproof proofer out there listening, get on Amazon and just order the trio. You'll be glad you did. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and in closing too, John, can you tell us a little bit about the value builder system? Cause I think that might be helpful for um, some people listening, if you don't mind that that's yours as well. Correct. Yeah, that's a software company I run. We help entrepreneurs improve the value of their business. Um, uh, so yeah, it's uh, it, 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 we've got it's driven by eight factors that impact the value of the company. A lot of them we've talked about today. In fact, recurring revenue, the importance of making sure the business isn't dependent on you. So if folks want to learn a little bit more about that. It's valuebuilder.com. Cool. Awesome. Really appreciate you taking the time for us, John. This is great and great to have your insight into dentistry. Dentistry needs help. And uh, I think you've provided a lot of that today. So thank you. Well, you guys are making a huge difference. Thanks for having me. Thanks, sure John. So. Take care, thank man. you, John. 